everyone. So how many of you have seen that person before? Is this the first time? Wow, Bonnie, that's great, thank you. So have you seen interpreters before? Do you know how interpreters work then? So he's going to voice for me while I sign. And then I might voice a little bit as well. Let's see how things go. So self-advocacy, how to use it to create the future life. That's my topic for today. Everyone has a story. This is mine. I didn't know about interpreters until much later in life. I thought they made a huge, the world of difference in what I learned around me. I was born deaf to a huge family, and I grew up using oral communication. Growing up oral and mainstream, I wanted to fit in my hearing peers. I was lucky enough to have family and friends who were supportive of me and did their best to include me in their lives. Even then, I still experienced hearing privilege every day, not understanding or realizing how much I had missed out on. For example, my teachers often talk while writing on the chalkboard. They would still forget to, talk, to not talk, even after being reminded. I'd also miss out on homework assignments because teachers shout them out at the bell as people were leaving. So again, that chalkboard, that was my experience. As they spoke to the wall, I would miss out on so much because I couldn't hear what they were doing. I couldn't see their faces, their lips as they're speaking. It was an everyday experience. Again, homework assignments, you know, when that bell went off, the class was ready to leave, and the teacher would shout out those assignments the last minute, well, it's due tomorrow, and I would miss out on that because I couldn't hear. Group and social gatherings, I had a hard time following conversations. And when I asked what I'd missed, you know, because the conversation moved so quickly, I'd just be told, oh, never mind. So, no matter whether that's being what was happening, they would say, never mind. And I'd miss out on those conversations. Later in life, I learned more about the deaf community and realized how much I was missing out on. It was okay to be that. It was normal. There are many people like me. I had, I had found my peers and decided I wanted more of this and transformed myself from deaf to deaf with a capital D, and I never looked back. And the, that capital D is related to being culturally deaf. To be clear, I did have a support circle who treated me as normally as they could with their limited understanding of what I was experiencing, but with my own limited understanding back then as well. And with this, the realization that I had to relearn what it meant to be me, to be deaf. What it was like to have an identity that allowed me to come in my own as a fully realized person. To believe that I have every right to be functionally equivalent to the rest of the world. I reframed my thinking, found my ground, and instead of working to put myself to the other side, I wanted them to meet me somewhere in the middle. This is where I put myself on the path to learn how to advocate for myself. And while my story is specific, everyone has stories too. Self-advocacy is a tool to support your story. You are, are all responsible for the quality of life you want to have. You need to reframe your thinking. Wait, you need to wake up. You are normal and have every right to be in the room as anyone else. And don't let anyone say otherwise. 
don't let them kick you out or say that you shouldn't be there. The new normal is diversity. That's everyone here in this room. And self-advocacy, the idea that isn't about being confrontational or litigious or escalating complaints. It's about sharing your story, helping others to learn about you, learn how you live, what your needs are, and reaching, reaching a mutual understanding, which includes you becoming an ally for them as well. And that's really important. That you are an ally for them. Allies can come from anywhere, and that includes you. You're supporting each other. And allies, yeah, they come from anywhere, everywhere, again, including yourself. And the first step is to self declare, share your story. This is not a weakness. Your own personal story will have a more powerful impact on others because it's an option for them to learn firsthand from you. Your life's change for the better will not happen without your advocacy. The cumulative effect of both you and others cannot be ignored. You will have an impact on others, and likewise. So in my job, before I used interpreters. I had to figure out how to run group reviews of my work. Before, I'd present on the screen and struggle to take notes through that process. It, it's, it's hard for me to look both what I was presenting as well as the notes I was trying to take. And again, collecting that feedback was difficult. I was shy and nervous. And I was worried about how to interact, what to say. So in that frame of mind, I changed how my review meetings worked by printing out my work and taking it to the walls and giving pens to my stakeholders to mark it up. And so the feedback was written on the walls for me. Again, that's not a conversation. And after advocating for myself and sharing my story with my team, I knew I couldn't continue that way. So I got interpreters, and now I can participate in conversations in real time. They make sure I understand what's being said in the room, I feel much more confident in the room, and I feel like I have an equal voice, and I'm not missing anything, and can join the discussion that's happening. Again, I, you have to explain what you need and tell them what your needs are. So again, hearing privileges. The self advocacy part is hard because there are outside forces that are influencing you. And some of those examples that make it even harder are hearing privilege which, for those who don't know, are the advantages and opportunities that you receive from being, having the ability to hear in a hearing society. One example is the airport. You know, they make announcements that your plane is about to take off. And I can't hear that. But that's a hearing privilege. It happens every day, these announcements that are going on, and I don't have access to those. The next one is autism, which is discrimination against deaf people. Now, you all know what discrimination is, but that's specifically against deaf individuals. And deficit thinking is really the process of blaming the victim. It's a model found on imputation, not documentation. It, it's, if you'll say that they're less than, oh, never mind, he's deaf. And again, the lack of education and self awareness, that's, that's how I grew up. 
and waking up and realizing that I can make my life better. But I have to advocate to make that happen. And different people are in different places in life, whether they're awoke or not. And you have to respect everyone for where they are in their life. And they're welcome time for them. And maybe, maybe not everyone will have to wake up, but that's going to happen when they're ready for it. When I first made contact with my current uh, lawyer at Amazon, they asked me to do a phone screen. And phone screens are, are a common situation for companies like Amazon. And hoping for the best outcome, I self declared that I was deaf, and that I preferred to chat over instant messenger because I can't use the telephone. And a chat over I am works best for me because I prefer a direct conversation. I want us to be functionally equivalent, where we both were limited to typing text in a chat window. Neither of us would have a communication advantage over the other, and nothing would be misunderstood. That was important to me, so I advocated for it. Once I self declared what I needed and shared my story, the recruiter understood and became my ally to help accommodate my interviewing experience. And again, those allies come from everywhere, and the recruiter in this situation helped me through that communication and interview process. Part of waking up is to know your rights. And there are different laws that cover different areas. And it's important to understand those laws. In some scenarios, they apply to different, different, you know, depending on the ADA. It's, it's a really powerful and protective law, but it can be easily abused. It's a double edged sword. It's all hinges on a single word reasonable. And what's reasonable to you is not to the other. It's ultimately up to the judge to interpret that word in the context of a given situation. It's really sometimes to come down to flipping a coin. Who knows what the results will be in that situation? The Department of Transportation and the Air Carrier Access Act. I said before about making sure that how important it is to self declare. If you do not self declare, the airlines are not liable for accommodating your safety. They have to be informed about your needs. And so again, if a plane crashes and you're hurt, you know, if, if you have to declare your rights as, as self-advocate, then, then you are liable for it, not them. It's currently being updated. Again, that ACAA Carrier Access Act. And so there's a lot of language around regulating service animals as well that isn't clear and is often abused uh, with personal pets on flights. I've seen that over and over again. And the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA. The problem we had before the broadcast and television without captions is now happening with the internet. And two of the biggest uh, issues with that is streaming the video and podcasts. Podcasts are everywhere, and I can't listen to them. And that's a problem there as well. So that law is currently being worked on as well. The Hearing Aid Compatibility Act. So it's a similar idea with captions before that this one ensures that phone devices are compatible with hearing aids. And it's similar to the decoding technology for captions that have been compatible with various televisions. And there are other laws that you need to find that are specific to your need and learn as much as you can about what's out there to protect you and your needs.
So I told you all the stories, and I don't want to give you the, all the impression that sharing your stories will make life wonderful. You will run into conflicts that require education. And it's not a party where everyone suddenly understands it when you, you share your story. It requires education and escalation. And so sometimes a measured response is the best approach. We should strive to create allies through understanding. This is how we can enrich our lives in the face of those motivations. So if you think it through, what do you really want out of this? What's the goal? How is that other person responding? And are they friendly? Are they hostile towards you? Are they ignorant? Or are they more open-minded? Are they willing to work with you? Or are they resistant to the change? And will the law support a position that you have to escalate it? And is the outcome worth the effort that you're going to have to put in? People have different goals from simple requests up to systemic change. So you need to help them help you explain what needs to be done to the appropriate person with the authority to make it happen. Be willing to have a conversation and seek to work with them. Sometimes they just don't know. And the resolution is, is simple. It's not always about going to get a lawyer. Sometimes it's just simple as a pen and paper to communicate. It's an easy, simple solution. So it depends on the situation. You go to the store because you want to buy some candy, often this is the solution. You go to see a play or performance or a store or a business that's more complicated, maybe. Maybe legal escalation is required. It depends on the situation. If that party is not working with you, then and, and you go and seek out legal resources, you need to plan and advise them so that you can track your efforts. Because documenting all those things you've done and all the interactions, it shows that you've reasonably tried to work with this other party. Then again, you, you, if that still doesn't work, then you have to seek out those legal resources to investigate and figure out how to fix that problem. Again, those lawyers have the experience in dealing with these kind of situations. So, what, once you once you've sort of gone through that self advocacy process, you'll find it actually is fairly rewarding. You'll have increased self confidence and self determination. There's an independence that comes through that increased expression of your normalcy. When you've widened your circle with new allies who do understand your story. And your, your support network and circle becomes much bigger, and those opportunities also grow. And you, you have a chance to strengthen your quality of life through a richer, more inclusive experience. Your advocacy yeah. contributes to the cumulative effect, and that will benefit others as well. So not only you, the next person who comes around will understand more. So all of us have stories, and they'll be similar to other people. But everyone will benefit from it. Thank you for letting me share my story with you. I have a list here of some resources for Seattle and Washington State. And if you want to learn more or curious about it, any of these resources would be a good option to check out.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Now it's open for questions. So sometimes self-advocacy seems to come with some risk, especially if you're in a place that does not offer support. What are some ways to mitigate that risk for people who may, for example, like lose their job if they really push for this? That's a good question. It really depends on the kind of conflict. If it's one on one with a friend who maybe doesn't understand that someone who's deaf or maybe new to that experience. But if you're working with a business, one example that comes to mind. If it's a big business, you find out how they get their money. I mean, if it's federal, federal, through federal funding. And you need to let them know if you have federal funding that the ADA law applies. Sometimes you have these resources who can help advocate for you. And this, then all those resources you do is show them what they do. You know, that's really the best answer I could give. Sorry. It really depends uh, on the particular situation. One thing that you, one thing you mentioned was the uh, idea of when to, to stop advocating when it gives too much energy. I'm like, I relate to that a lot. I was curious if you had any strategies for um, when to when when to notice that. And I would point it out because a lot of times in the past um, I've just gone into exhaustion and that's when I decided it was time to quit. On a personal level, with my family, you know, we've been fighting in Seattle Public Schools for my two boys. I mean, the education sucks. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. In terms, at least as it relates to, to deaf students. And you get to a point where every year we're fighting the same battles again and again with a new teacher. In the new the new system and, and you get to the point you can sell the sell schools this as a system you know they're not willing to change and so you end up fighting the same battles so it does get exhausting and I look at my boys and I think to myself I'm doing this for them I want them to get a good education I want them to have you know a good Upbringing. So I keep going to that one. So everyone has different motivations that will keep help them keep going until they decide to stop. It depends on the context and what you want for and what you really want out of that situation. Hi. Um. Thank you. First of all, for talking. Sorry. So thank you for talking about this. Um, I'm also deaf. I uh, have cochlear implants, and I struggle with uh, self-identifying, and um, because I kind of pass as a hearing person, um, but that doesn't make me actually hearing. I still need accommodation. And, you know, I think someone said earlier that there's a serious risk. And in my case, I felt like more recently I started self-identifying as deaf in job interviews and that kind of thing. And I started to think that there was more advantage to letting people know that I was deaf and that I needed help as opposed to disadvantages. And it's not a great position to be in still, because I feel like I'm still open to discrimination, but that's the position that I'm in. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how I can become more comfortable with that position. There are many layers on there. Mm 
don't know. There's always a risk that we don't know when you reach out in that way. I don't think I've ever been with the community. I don't think I've ever I've experienced wanted. discrimination, but I've always sort of wondered. I, I tend to save emails from recruiters who say that they they, uh, they love my portfolio, I really like they want to work with me, and I save those. And they think I'm qualified. Because I look for those things first before I proceed to protect myself. And that's how, how I operate before. Maybe. You know, compare the world today to how it was back then, where I am. There, I'm trusting they're going to be open-minded and willing to work to accommodate you. That, that's where you have to get to. If you've experienced discrimination, I would recommend that you document everything. In YouTube, just look, looking for work, find out who the hiring manager is, or who the HR is, reach out to them. Give them an opportunity to fix that problem first. Maybe it's only that one person, and that person can be removed from it, and the rest of the organization may be fine. But you have to ask yourself, you know, Look at the company as a whole, if they are inclusive and accessible, and, you know, and that, that's an environment you want to work in. Again, a, you want a company that has an inclusive culture. If you've been given an offer to work there, and that's the right time to open up the, the, the conversation about accommodation and accessibility is to find out if the culture is acceptable and so you understand what kind of team you're working with. Are they willing to work with what your needs might be? For example, so for phone calls, uh, Switch over to I am, or you know, the, the when they want to talk to you, you know, calling your name first. Those little things, those little needs that have, happen when you're deaf, you want to make sure the team is willing to work with those. The risk will always be there. And sometimes you just take that first step. But as you take that first step, document your experience, uh, especially if you're experiencing discrimination. Hello, um, thank you. Um, so my particular story is with ADHD. Um, I have times where I don't know whether I will be able to reach normalcy as other people seem to have. And part of the reason is I don't know how to get there. I don't know what the steps would look like in order for me to be able to simulate uh, what other people seem to be able to do naturally. Can you speak to that? So you know yourself best. And you know your own limitations. And you know whether something's going to work for you or not. And I would think that if you're going to work with a team and you're working closely with them, that there's trust there to open up the conversation about it. Maybe talk to your manager first in that situation share your concerns about it, and maybe there'll be some education that needs to happen when you express your needs. If you're not comfortable with your manager, then you may have to get HR involved, so you have that conversation in the same room with both of them together. That's my first recommendation. 
and depending on the outcome of that conversation with the manager, ideally they become your ally, and then you can get the team together and work with them to help address your needs specifically. To talk more about the ADHD, like that's the that's the best starting place. If you have to escalate through HR, I'm not sure the specific structure of your organization. But again, you know, have to sort of run at the flagpole. And at Amazon, they have what's called the skip level meetings. So I'd, I'd go to my manager's manager, so I'd skip that and show them. And I'd feel like I was blocking out uh, my manager. But if I'm still not satisfied after talking to the manager, I can, I can go up to my manager's manager to get the help I need. And often if you're already afraid to approach a manager, then it's even harder to skip over. But that is one possibility. And I was told that was the last question. If you have more questions or if you want to know more detail, I will be around. Please come and say hello. Thank you so much.